Um, my name is Cliff. Thank you for coming out. I'm obviously with Roxon. Uh, and I usually start off now. How many people have heard of Roxon? A couple. Oh, actually, more than a couple. Okay, great. Um, so we're a little bit new to North America. Um, we are the market leader over in Europe when it comes to ceiling tiles. Um, and about six years ago, we brought everything over to North America. So we're going to go through and I'll skip through the legal stuff. I'm good at getting through this presentation quickly so I get you back to work on time. Um, so at Rockfarm, we're a complete ceiling solution provider. And what that means is we not only manufacture the, the tile, but we also manufacture the grid. And we're one of the largest manufacturers of metal ceiling. Um, the, met, the, the grid and the metal ceilings came through our acquisition of Chicago Metallics. And a lot of people know Chicago Metallics. They've been around since 1960. Um, but in 2013, when we came over to North America, it became obvious that we needed the grid and um, the metal ceiling solutions as well. Um, a lot of people think that Rockbond is new. We're new to North America, but again, we've been making tiles since 1962. Um, we are headquartered in uh, Denmark. Our North America headquarters are in Chicago. Our grid manufacturing occurs here in Baltimore. Um, and our uh, first manufacturing facility is in Marshall County, Mississippi. And we have our second under construction out in West Virginia. This is up on the Panhandle, West Virginia. So it's going to be really close to a lot of our lead four points. We now need to be within uh, 100 miles. So that's going to put us well, um, very close to it at least. Under the Rockwell uh, umbrella, and Rockwell is the parent company, there are 30 different units that use various um, uh, densities of stone wool. Here in North America, you, a lot of people know Rockwell has become a household name at this point. They're the insulation arm. Um, Rockwell is obviously the acoustic ceilings. Rodan is really interesting. This is stone wool, just like we use an in insulation or ceiling, but it's used for a growing medium for hydroponics. Uh, so roots are able to grow through, but the stone wool doesn't compete for water or nutrient resources and is reusable. So um, we've been making a lot of uh, gains with Rodan lately. Rock panel is not here yet. It's the next business unit coming, but this is a super high density version of stone wool that is used as a curtain wall system. So it gives you insulation value and it's also uh, paintable. Uh, you paint it over and over again and it will last for hundreds of years, literally. Um, so we just covered uh, the uh, Marshall County facility. We actually share that facility with Roxwell Insulation. They have two facilities up in Canada that um, are just for the insulation. One in Ontario, the other is out on the West Coast in British Columbia. But so at this point, what I'm going to explain to you is what is stone wool. Um, this is the core of all our products, and um, it's important to understand what it is. Um, but to start off, stone wool was actually discovered, and it was discovered on the Hawaiian Islands in the early 1800s. <coughs> and the Hawaiian Islands had a unique um, setup where you had volcanic eruption and you had 80 mile an hour trade winds coming through that would pull these eruptions off before it hit the ground. And it naturally turned um, rock into wool. And the Hawaiians would gather all these tufts that they found and they would use it for roofing. Stone wool is hydrophobic and we're, we're gonna go in, in depth on that in a second, but water just rolls right off it. So it's a great medium for roofing. Um, so the, the stone wool was brought back to Europe. Geologists looked at it and said, well, all this is is basalt and we were all trying to figure out how do we do this uh, in a manufacturing setting. In 1909, we actually succeeded. Um, to this day, there's only one other firm out there that is uh, producing stone wool, and we are by far the leader in that category. Um, so what goes into uh, stone wool? It's very, very simple. The majority of it is basalt rock. And basalt rock is, uh, in geological terms, is considered a new rock. Um, so when a volcano erupts and you see lava flows, when that lava cools, it cools into a basalt. If you leave that same basalt under the earth for 50,000 years, it actually turns into granite under high pressure. Um, but it's actually Earth's most abundant uh, stone out there. 
Volcanoes put 38,000 units into the um, into the um, uh, onto the earth every day. We take out one unit, so we're not in danger of running out of it. What's really nice, though, is the steel industry has been mining basalt forever, um, and iron comes up in basalt formation. So, <coughs> excuse me. The uh, the steel industry will take the basalt, extract the iron. And for about 160 years, they've been tossing what's called slag at that point into piles. So today we're putting this on rail cars and bringing it down to our facility in Mississippi or up into Canada. Um, and when you're done with any stonewall products, it's fully recycled. We turn it into briquettes and we put it right back into the, uh, the manufacturing process. So this is a, a great video. It's, a, it's actually a History Channel How It's Made video, and it's condensed. So I'm going to set it up for you real quick because it jumps. Um, first thing you're going to see is a big pile of rocks. Second thing you'll see is we pulverize those rocks, and then it goes into the furnace. So, so it's spun into, think of uh, like a cotton candy process. It's not a patented process, so we hide it from you. So you're going to go from the uh, the furnace to the the stone wall really quickly, and I'll talk over it from there. So we're pulverized. This run, we're bringing recycled material in. It's in the furnace. And right away, you'll see the stone wall comes out. When it's hot, it's bright white. As it cools, it turns into a darkish brown color. But what we simply do is compress it to whatever application we're, we, we need at the moment. In this case, we're making three quarter inch ceiling tiles. One thing to note is nobody on the production line has to wear respiration protection or eye protection. We have over 100 years of state data that says this is not harmful to anyone. So it's basically as simple as that. It takes exactly a half hour or less to go from a rock to a finished ceiling tile. So it's a very quick process. Another thing to note is no water is used in the process. Water is an expensive interest today. Not only expensive to source, but then it needs to be cleaned and then discharged. And um, when you start adding water into your process, things get expensive quick. Um, and the last thing to note with the manufacturing is the furnaces are all um, heated through natural gas. So we're not burning coal or anything like that. So everything is natural gas. It's the same fuel a lot of us use in our homes to, to cook. So the properties of stone wool and why we use it at Rock Bond is mostly for the acoustic comfort. Um, but the fire performance is off the charts. You have to get back up to 2,800 degrees, which is volcanic temperatures, just to melt it. It actually won't catch fire, it'll just melt. The humidity resistance that we talked about. Um, but what's really important, because it's inherently humidity resistant, it's also inherently mold and mildew resistant. Mold and mildew cannot grow on it. Um, and that's without adding chemicals or anything to the mix. It just inherently will not let um, mold or mildew or microorganisms grow. So the use of suspended ceilings, everybody knows the, uh, the plenum, the area above the, uh, the, the suspended ceiling. The whole reason we use suspended ceilings is to hide all the wires, pipes, everything that's up in the plenum that we don't want people to see. Um, actually, a neat little illustration, we put the pipes in, lighting, <clears throat> then we begin to put the grid in and then the tiles so we get a nice monolithic look to the ceiling but we also have access back up there engineers can get back up um, but it's not all aesthetics we're also a lot of times it's the only surface that's capturing sound um, and when you have a lot of sound in a room it's nice to have surfaces that are going to absorb that sound <laughs> So when we talk about suspended ceilings, what do we use? Wood and metal are at the high end of the spectrum. Fiberglass and gypsum are, uh, you know, medium level. But what's really probably 85% of the U.S. market, and it's what we have above our heads, 
is what we call wet felt in mineral fiber. It's a fancy way of saying paper that's glued together with a starch. Um, so it's a paper-based product and it's just held together with the starches so it doesn't fall apart. But today we also have the option of using stone wool. So the performance <coughs> attributes, and the first one we're gonna hit on is obviously acoustic. Um, back in the early 1900s, Florence Nightingale, and a lot of us know her as the mother of modern nursing, she would do uh, study after study. And you have to remember, back in the early 1900s, when you were in a hospital in a recovery room, it was basically a big warehouse with beds in there. It was a loud uh, environment. She would take a small group of patients and put them in a nice, quiet environment. And every study uh, came out to the same result, that patients that were allowed to recover in a quiet environment recovered faster and didn't end up in the hospital um, with relapses as often. So there is a direct correlation between noise and stress and physiology um, that is uh, documented. So when we talk about acoustics, there's a lot of vocabulary words. There's really only two that we look at, NRC and CAC. And NRC is what we really look at the most. And NRC is uh, sound absorption. It's a measure of how much sound um, is being absorbed. So my voice, how much of my voice is being absorbed by the ceiling tiles above us. This tile happens to be 55% above us. We'd like to see that number get a little higher. Um, but in certain cases, you are going to need the opposite, not sound absorption. You're going to need sound blocking. We want, uh, so if we were all very important people here and we wanted to make sure that our conversation wasn't making it somewhere else in the, in the building, we want to look at high CAC tiles. So those are the two that we're going to talk about um, throughout this presentation. So it's important to, to kind of define that. And to illustrate it, this red arrow represents sound. And as it hits the tile, say 90% gets hung up and absorbed in the tile. 5% will transmit into the plenum. The other 5% will reflect into the room. A high CAC tile is the opposite. The sound hits it, and it just reflects into the room. We haven't dealt with it, but we're keeping it from going from one place to the other, which is important in some situations. Um, it's a big room, so I'm not gonna play all these audio files, but what we're showing here, 125 hertz to 16,000 hertz is basically uh, the spectrum of human um, uh, speech. So this is important because this is what we're trying to capture. Yeah. So when the sound is reflected, are you getting an echo? Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second. You end up with a reverberation, um, and that is the part that really makes it difficult for people to hear, is when you, you get the reverberation. In a slide or two, I actually play a couple audio files, which will demonstrate when you get that high reverberation time. Um, and that's kind of why I'm setting this up, is, what we're trying to do when we put together a tile is we're trying to capture the sounds that are generated by a building. 90% of the sounds are generated by human activity. So that's why we're always looking at that 125 hertz to 16,000 hertz range. What's interesting is uh, 16,000 hertz, you can only hear it if you're under the age of 26, 25. You start to lose that ability to hear those high frequency sounds. Um, Years ago, I had to slide up on my computer, and my daughter was in middle school at the time. And she's like, oh, Dad, the girls in uh, school set the ringtones to 15,000 hertz. And I, was like, I looked at her like, why? And she's like, well, the teachers can't hear it, but we, we can hear it. And so I thought it was amazing that, you know, sixth graders had figured that out. Um, so talking about classrooms, um, every year, the Acoustic Society of America does the same test. They take 11th graders, they put them in a typical classroom, and they read them third grade words. So these are three and four letter words. And every year the same result uh, is obtained. Only 75% of the words are understood by the students. And that's because the acoustics of most of our classrooms are not great. Um, if my school was uh, cinder, painted cinder block walls, ACT tile, and, uh, and a tile similar to what we have there, and you see concrete doesn't give as much sound absorption. Uh, VCT is zero, glass maybe 5%. You really don't make any gains so you get down the carpeting and not every school has carpeting. 
Um, so we always look up to our ceiling. Wet belted tiles can give you 50 to 80%. In the past, if we wanted more, we'd have to go to fiberglass. But if, as you can see, stone wool will give you 60 to 100%, depending on the density and the thickness. So it's very versatile. So this is our two audio files. The first one is recorded in a room with 5% sound absorption. You will hear a lot of reverberation. This, so the second file, we take the same exact room, same speaker, same setup, and all we do is add stone wool to the ceiling. Happens to be a 90 NRC, 90% sound absorbent uh, stone wall, but you should be able to hear the difference right away. So you can kind of understand what he's saying, but you're hearing the same sound over and over again. It's just allowed to keep the energy, the sound energy is allowed to keep moving until it runs out of energy on its own. So again, what we're doing now is on the second file, same room, we put sound absorbent stone wall, and you should hear a dramatic difference here. In doing so, he became the founder of modern acoustic engineering. He went on to design the acoustics of Hudson Symphony Hall, still considered one of the best halls for music in the world. So even with an accent, we can now understand him because we're not hearing those same sounds overlapping each other. Um, so that's why it's important to have that sound absorbing material uh, whenever possible. Um, so CAC, we talked about NRC just now, sound absorption. CAC, there are really only two situations where you need high CAC tiles. And <clears throat> this is one where you have an open plenum design. For whatever reason, we couldn't build the wall all the way to the deck. We share an open plenum, and we want to make sure this lawyer that's talking to his client isn't heard by the person in the adjacent room, obviously for privacy issues, or if it's a doctor, we have HIPAA regulations that we can't have uh, sound traveling out. In this situation, we would have to look at a high CAC tile. Really, Walls are for blocking. You really should have a plenum barrier or just build the wall all the way to the deck. But if those aren't options, then we go to the high CAC offering. Um, and I did say there was one other uh, situation. If you have mechanicals up in the plenum, it's a good idea to have high CAC tiles. And what you're doing is the opposite. You're, not, you're keeping noise from moving in the plenum down into the, the workspace or the livable space. Um, so again, you have air handlers or anything, then we would look at high CAC tiles. So switching over to the uh, the fire performance, um, we all know it's not always the fire that gets this, it's the smoke. Um, and any um, seconds and minutes um, that we can add will help a lot. So in North America, um, we always look at class A ratings when it comes to, to tiles. But class A is not all equal. For plane development, you can go from zero to 25. For smoke development, you can be a zero to 450, so a really large spectrum, and still earn a class A rating. Um, so how they actually go about testing it, and this is UL that does the testing, and we have to do this every year. They put 24 feet of uh, ceiling tiles in the test chamber. They light a fire at this end, and then there's a fan trying to push that fire as far down the 24 feet as possible. Um, so on the, the right block, you see where the fire's lit, all the tiles are in place, and the fan is pushing from your left to right. And in a moment, in Stonewall's case, they're going to do a visual observation. Um, you'll see in a second. So you see the scorching right where the fire was, but as we move down the line, the fire was not able to spread. Um, as you get six, seven, eight tiles down, you're back to uh, brand new tiles. For this reason, every year at every facility, we earn exactly a zero on flame development. We said a moment ago, 2,800 degrees just to melt it. It actually won't catch fire at that point. Um, a typical building fire, or structure fire, will burn between 800 and 1,000 degrees, so we're never going to approach 
the temperatures needed to um, you know melt stone water. <clears throat> so I'm actually on. I didn't pick the music on this video. Turn the volume down. Um, this is another UL laboratory. <laughs> it's chariots of fire. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, a test again we have to do every year. 1994 is the last year they actually gave us the videos. They don't provide them anymore. We have gypsum in the left, bone walls on the center chamber, and fiberglass is in the right chamber. And this is a grid and tile test. So they put the grid, they put the tile, and they light a fire, and they observe. And what they're looking for is um, there's actually sensors in there to tell them how much smoke is developed, but they're looking for how long it takes to fail. Right now. <laughs> Somebody thought they were funny. <laughs> Um, so cheating a little bit, this is fiberglass and it's going to be the first to fail. Um, again, we pay a premium to get up to fiberglass for its, uh, for its NRC or sound absorption, but at four minutes it fails. This is an issue for firefighters. When the piles start failing, they have to pause and reevaluate. There's a lot of oxygen in the, the plenum that will come down. Eight and a half minutes, gypsum's on fire. Um, so now, once you see flames, you're developing a lot of smoke. Well, smoke is um, your worst enemy in a structure fire. So in a second, they're going to show you the aftermath of the left and right chambers or the, the fiberglass and the gypsum. We're still running in that center chamber. So 15 and a half minutes, everything's disintegrated. To make a long story short, we stay in this test chamber eight hours every year. Um, so for that reason, we talked about class A. Flame development, again, is a zero. Smoke development is a five. So the zero to 450, we're on a five. And that five only comes from the waterborne paint that flashes off during the fire. So it's a little bit of smoke created, and that's the end of it. So we're... Now I'm going to shift gears over to the hydrophobic properties because, again, it doesn't absorb water. We're going to talk about mold, mildew, microorganisms, and we all know that there's a lot of different health issues that arise when we work or live in environments with mold and mildew. Um, but, again, I keep saying it, it's high, stone wool is hydrophobic. What's more important is um, you can have stone wool in 100% relative humidity without getting any sagging to the tile. Um, around the beltway here, most of our school systems leave their HVAC systems on, but as you get out to rural areas, in the summer they turn them off. So it's very important that they keep an eye on the humidity and turn the systems back on because the, the tiles will, will, won't withstand 100% relative humidity. Um, but in a hospital setting, um, you need three things for life to take hold. And when I say life, it's mold, mildew, microorganisms, MRSA. So the three things is heat, water, and a food source. With stone wool, we take away two of those three. We take away water, we take away the food source. Um, so again, inherently, nothing can grow on it. Why is this important for hospitals? They're, they are really searching out for material that will not um, let anything grow on it. MRSA is a big problem with hospitals. You don't get MRSA walking down the street. You, uh, the majority of MRSA cases happen in a hospital setting. It's very expensive for them because now they have to treat you and make sure that you recover and monitor everything. Um, so again, by taking away uh, microorganisms' ability to grow, without adding chemicals into it, it's a big plus for, um, for hospitals. Medical grade tiles will come in ISO class five that go all the way up to ISO class three or clean room environments. You can use ISO three in operating room um, if you have a gasket and grid system. So we're just talking about hospitals. They are looking, so they're looking for things that they can clean as well. And I keep, driving home the hydrophobic property. <laughs> stone wool, every single tile can be steam cleaned once a year. The medical grade tiles can be steam cleaned once a month. And this is important be uh, because 
if they do have a MRSA breakout, they can come through and clean the whole, um, all six sides of the room. They don't have to now skip the ceiling tiles. Um, now, this isn't just steam cleaning. You can go as far as putting chlorine, ammonia, some heavy-duty chemicals. It's not going to affect the, the tiles at all. So if you are you know, working in a healthcare setting, it is uh, something to consider. We talked about um, the paint. The paints contain a low VOC formula. The only VOCs are in the paint. We are certified by CHIPS if you're doing school designs. And one thing um, Stonewall can say is every single tile carries the uh, Green Guard Gold certification. Not just one here or there, but every single tile. Light reflectance, I don't spend a lot of time on this. The, the reason is every single white tile on the market falls somewhere between 80% and 88% light reflectance. Um, if you were to put two rooms side by side, it's very difficult to tell the difference. Years ago, this was a um, big concern because 23 to 29% of our electricity was used on lighting. Today on the newer buildings, the lead light is bringing this number way down. It's actually fall, has fallen below 10% in a lot of buildings. Um, so we're not always trying to maximize the use of the outdoor light. Um, but if you go over 90%, too bright, under 70, too dark. So the design attributes of stone wall are simple. Um, first thing is every surface is smooth. We don't, uh, stone wall doesn't need to poke holes in the tile. The fissures you see in like the tiles above us are there to capture more sound. Um, the sound gets caught in those fissures and it's not allowed to exit. Um, but because Stonewall does a great job of capturing that sound, there's no need to start um, putting textures or fissures in the, on the surface. But it's all the edges, sizes, shapes, forms that you've been used to specifying. Again, no fissures. But it has a nice, clean, smooth aesthetic. When it comes to the edge details, again, it's everything you've been used to. Square laying is still the most popular, followed by the tegular edges, um, whether you're on a narrow 916th grid or a wider 1516th grid. And the fastest growing segment is the concealed edge. And this is where we make the, uh, the grid disappear. So um, it's a really neat system. With stone wool, the tiles are individually demountable. In the past, the concealed system was, it was called progressive. You start in that corner, you work your way all the way to this one. But if you need to access this tile, you then got to peel tiles back and get to it. With Stonewall, we have enough flexibility where you can lift up, go to the right, go to the left, and the tile comes down. So you can, engineers can go to any single tile and pull them out with a concealed system. When it comes to sizes, two by twos, two by fours are still the most <coughs> popular. The fastest gaining are the two by fives, two by six, two by eight. Um, I usually warn people, the two by eights are really neat and neat, but they <coughs> will increase your installation cost. Um, you need two individuals to install the <coughs> tile. Um, so two by fours, two by twos, one guy can grab a couple cases and go through. But with two by eights, you absolutely need two people to lift it up and get it into place. So it's something to consider. That's not true with the two by fives and two by sixes. One person can put those up. Um, colors, we can do any custom color, if, uh, and we have 34 standard colors. So um, they're available in all the same sizes, edges um, uh, that, that you need or um, want to specify. And then shapes and forms. This is when we look at baffles or island systems. And I'm going to grab this to illustrate. If we orient the tile this way, we call it a baffle. If we do it horizontally, we call it a, a, an island. They're very simple to install. A baffle, you only put two uh, plastic screws in each corner, <coughs> run a line to the deck, and they just hang there. Um, the same is true with islands, except for we put four wires running to the deck. Very low insulation costs, and in both systems, you get high sound absorption. Um, this is actually a museum up in New York. Um, they designed it originally without any sound absorption. When they opened, it became obvious quickly that they had a problem. We went back through and put the island systems in. We tested it, and this actually tested out as a 90 
uh, NRC or 90% sound absorption. So the reason I bring that up is you can get the same sound absor absorption as a, a tile and grid system uh, with an island system. So you don't always have to, you know, put a tile and grid system. You can get creative and look at baffles and other things. What's this in the lapidary panels? It's taking the place of lapidary. Panels. Yeah, and what's really neat, and we've done a lot of testing. What happens? Um, so the sound that makes it up through the dark areas here will actually hit the deck, come down, and get trapped on the way down. So if it's not caught on the way up, it's caught on the way down. That's how we're absorbing 90% of the sound in, in those situations. So segment-specific demands. I don't spend a ton of time here. It gets repetitive. So, um, well, But when we're looking at facilities, we're always looking at acoustics, fire safety, aesthetics are important. We like that smooth finish. Um, when we get into healthcare, we then look at speech privacy and HIPAA regulations. They tell us what we need to do to keep sound blocking from room to room. Um, again, your walls should uh, provide that sound blocking. So the summary, again, it's repetitive, but it's acoustics, fire performance, humidity, it's the hygiene, <laughs> nothing's going to grow on it. Um, it's going to improve the indoor air quality. Uh, light reflection is always going to be somewhere between 80 and 88%. But most importantly, it's all the same edges, sizes, colors, everything that you've been used to. It's just a different substrate that we talked about. Um, so I'm out of the AIA portion, so I can kind of talk a little bit more about our tiles. Um, and what I'm going to do is pass around quickly. This is what we call a comparison board. Roxbon is across the top. Armstrong, and I only pick on them because everybody knows Armstrong. Um, they're across the bottom, and certain feet and USG are in the middle. Each one of these rows is a price point. And as I pass this around, I want you to look at the NRC, or the sound absorption level. Um, uh, Ultima, which is Armstrong's Ultima, generally gets 75 to 80 percent sound absorption. We can come down to our mid-level tile and outperform at 85 percent sound absorption. You usually see about a two dollar square foot savings by doing this. So if you're after Ultima just for the aesthetic, we can get you into a lower price point with comparable or better sound absorption. Um, I pass that around. So. Our basic tile starts at 75. So I just mentioned Ultima is a 75 NRC tile. Um, our standard Arctic starts at 75 NRC. Um, when we get to the mid-level, we're at our Tropic and Coral, we're at 85. And our Alaskan sonar will get up to, uh, Alaska's 90, sonar is 95%. So you're capturing almost everything in the room at that point. So what happens when you need high CAC? We simply put a DB behind the name, and we have an acoustic factor that's put on the tile that brings the CAC level up, brings it up to 35, and it goes as high as a 43 if you really need that much blocking. Um, you do that like a certain distance from the wall, or, or do you do it off the entire ceiling? No, it's, it's actually right on the back of the tile. So At the entire ceiling? or No, each, each individual wall. tile will get an acoustic backer applied to the back. Um, right, I'm asking, would it be for the entire space or just near the wall? No, it would be the back? entire space. If you needed a high CC, it's not just for certain, <clears throat> you have to do the whole thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting with CAC though, and we don't have it on this slide, we, um, we have another presentation that dives deeper into acoustics, but when we test for CAC, all we do is put grid and tile in. So there's no penetrations. There's no lights, there's no HVAC, sprinklers, speakers, any of that stuff. Um, the reality is once you start putting lights and penetrations in, you're decreasing that CAC value. A 43 typically will drop to about 22 um, on a CAC rating. So that's why we always um, say, if you need sound blocking, design your walls to do the sound block. Don't rely on the ceiling tiles. You will find um, path, sound will find pathways through. It's just like water, it finds the easiest path through. Um, we were talking earlier to somebody um, about a month ago. We had a, a, um, a law firm that was getting sound transmission from room to room. 
we came, our acousticians, PhDs came in from Chicago, set up microphones in one office and speakers in the other office. And after about four hours, the, the math was simple. It was coming through the outlets. So the, um, when they put the building together, they were supposed to have one outlet per stud. When, they, when the, uh, the electricians came through, they put two outlets per stud and the sound was coming straight through. So all this effort was put into ceilings and walls and blocking, and one mistake uh, allowed the conversation to be heard crystal clear from one room to the other. So, um, so again, CEC is important, but you have to take it with a grain of salt. There is a lot going on with that. Um, we talked about the medical grade tiles. There's a whole set of medical grades. The set is actually pretty interesting. There's one use for facet tiles. That's if you have a parking garage underneath an occupied uh, floor. So if you have the bottom four floors that are a parking garage and then you start with occupied space, the set is a four inch thick piece of stone wool that will absorb 100% of the sound in the garage. Uh, garages aren't conditioned, so with stone wool, because it's hydrophobic, it's resistant to humidity, we don't worry about it. Uh, but it will capture 100% before it gets into that occupied space above. Can that be directly attached or is it? No, it's, it's put into a suspension system. Um, you can kind of see it in here. I saw it. Yeah. A lot of times we just put it right up against the concrete. Yeah, you, the best way to get 100% sound absorption, you need at least one inch clearance above the tile. That air does a lot with the acoustics to disrupt things. Um, but there are direct mount tiles that can be glued directly there. Um, their NRC values are not as high because we eliminate that air gap. Um, so, but you can do that. Um, color all, we talked about 34 colors if you need them. Custom colors has about 12 week lead time. But if you need a custom color, we can put that together. The islands we talked about. And don't want to forget. Forget about the grid. We have all the grid offerings, whether it's 916, 1516, old stock grid. Um, you might know the trim is Axiom. We call it Infinity, but all those we have equals to along the way. And maybe next year you'll invite me back. We'll talk about metal ceilings. Um, metal ceilings get complicated very quickly. So if you have a metal ceiling need, Reach out to me, let me know. I'll get you in touch with our engineers in Chicago. If you could sketch it out, we can get a system put together for you. So that is everything, and I did it five minutes early. <laughs> yes. How do you get the tiles out in the concealed grid system? So the grid, um, you lift, say, the right side up. The grid lifts with it. Then it gives you enough room to slide over. The left side pops out, and everything comes down. So you're actually lifting the grid up about an inch, maybe an inch and a half to do that. So it's going up to the neighboring tile. Yeah, so the neighboring tile will come up with it, but then that will sit back down once you remove the tile. So. What's the binding agent for the tile? It's a resin, so I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's just, um, it was explained to me like, a, almost like a tongue oil that's put in there. Um, it's 0.002% of the overall composition of the tile, and it's really just to keep everything together. Yeah. All right, well, I really appreciate it. If anybody needs um, anything, our website's a great resource. Again, my name yep. is Cliff, so you can reach out anytime. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.